This conference will now be recorded. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this special webinar hosted by the PMSMCA. I am Jonathan Kowalski, the Executive Director of the Alliance. I want to thank all of you for joining us, as well as our presenters, who are going to lead our discussion on Wisconsin's construction lien law, what you need to know to protect yourself, uh, your company, and to avoid common mistakes. We are joined today by attorneys from the law firm of Michael Best and Friedrich. We have Roy Wagner and Lauren Trebenbach, both members of the Construction Law Group. Roy is the partner and chair, and Lauren is a partner and member. Uh, in addition, from the associations, we have Christopher Martinez of Dairyland Energy Solutions. Chris is going to be able to provide some practical um, context around a lot of the concepts we're going to cover. Uh, from an operational standpoint, at any point during the conversation, if you have a question, you could take yourself off mute. Everyone's starting on mute and feel free to, to interrupt. We'll be watching that as well. Or feel free to put a question into the chat room and I will be monitoring that and able to uh, put pause on the presentation and, and introduce those questions to our presenters. Uh, lastly, at the end, we will have uh, the opportunity for Q&A. So please don't hesitate to ask those questions. We've got the experts here to help you. Uh, most importantly, if you've got a question, I'm presuming uh, your partners here on this webinar have the same one and it'll maybe lead to some further discussion. But we're also gonna be try to, we're also going to try to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, we've got a tight hour here to fit a lot of content in. So uh, without that, without any uh, further ado, I will introduce Roy and Lauren from Michael Best and Chris from Dairyland, and I am going to put the slides on the screen. And Lauren and Roy, you can take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Trebenbach, and I am a partner and member of the Construction Law Group at uh, Michael Best and Friedrich. And joining me today is my partner and the chair of the Construction Law Group at Michael Best, Roy Wagner. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Uh, as I think Jonathan knows, we've had a, a near 15-year um, uh, engagement uh, with, uh, obviously, the Alliance, and we're glad to be participants here in the resource, and uh, hopefully finding ways to make sure that you get paid for the work you do, and the advantage that Wisconsin lien law uh, provides contractors in that in that practice. So uh, I'm going to let Lauren lead the, uh, the presentation, and Chris and I will apply uh, apply play-by-play -play and color commentary as we walk through this. Thanks, Roy. So first of all, let's talk about what we're going to cover today. Um, specifically, the reason you're all here, we're going to talk about the Wisconsin lien law, which is uh, contained within Chapter 779 of the Wisconsin statutes. We're going to talk about the function of the construction lien laws, why they exist, and how they can help you protect and uh, encourage payment on your construction projects. We're going to discuss the requirements for filing liens. Liens are very specific to certain timelines, and if you if you don't uh, use it, you lose it. So those timelines are very important. Uh, common mistakes. We see a lot of mistakes in our profession in the filing of liens, and we're going to help you try and avoid that. Careful use of lien waivers. I actually just uh, saw this happen about a week ago, where somebody inadvertently waived all their lien rights. So we're going to talk more about that. Oop, Jonathan, you took the controls. All right, and then um, also some, some recommendations from us as to what you should be doing to protect your, your rights. Um, and then lastly, some questions. So again, the statute 779, um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but for your reference, these are all the particular statutes that apply to the construction lien procedures. So this is here for your reference. Uh, we're gonna start by talking about the function of a construction lien. Most importantly, it protects contractors, designers, suppliers, um, and uh, others in the construction industry from non-payment by owners or prime contractors. It constitutes a legal encumbrance against the real estate. Um, and Roy's gonna tell us a little bit about what that means. Yeah, I think it's always important to understand that uh, uh, what you're essentially getting is if you have a 
um, a piece of real estate that doesn't have a mortgage against it, and you file a lien, your lien acts as uh, a quasi-mortgage against that real estate. Uh, once you do put a mortgage on the real estate, which obviously a lot of real estate has, and for instance, you're working on a new project or an existing project, your lien only is an encumbrance against the equity in the real estate. So if there's a million dollar piece of property and it has an $800,000 mortgage, your lien can only apply to that $200,000 amount of equity. So just because you have a lien doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get paid, for instance, because a lot of projects are underwater, they're over leveraged. And so if there's a million dollars piece of property that has $950,000 worth of encumbrances, that leaves a very narrow window for you to get paid and maybe not paid at all if it goes to actually a encumbrance. So we need to remember it's a lien against that equity. And careful compliant use of the lien procedures will give you um, increased assurance of payment and it, it produces a, a large amount of leverage, perhaps sometimes your best leverage the lower you are on the construction totem pole. So we're going to talk about the requirements. Um, liens, it, liens are governed by um, a certain set of definitions and it's very important to categorize yourself appropriately so you know which set of requirements to follow. So one of the typical questions we'll ask when we're working with someone is what role do you hold in the project? Are you a prime contractor, a subcontractor, or a supplier? Because it really is depends on who you are. There's a different set of rules and timelines for that. So many cases uh, um, a lot of the mechanical contractors will uh, for their maintenance work or the like will be working directly for the owner. Then you'll be a prime. If you're on a new project, you're likely, if you're a plumbing mechanical contractor, you're likely to be a sub uh, working for the general. So understanding that and the fact that you may be in both rules. Uh, so one of the, the questions that we also have to ask is making sure that your work is leanable. And we'll talk about what work is leanable under the lien statutes, um, importance of checking the timelines and preparing and service, serving those notices and claims in a timely manner. So uh, again, this is just to kind of list out the, the certain requirements. Um, it, it will also depend whether or not you uh, worked on a private or a public project, you, that public or private project was large or small, whether or not it contained a bond, and whether or not, um, again, it was a public project, which have a whole different set of guidelines. So this information will help to dictate your course of action. And the thing to remember is when for the small projects or the residential projects, that uh, consumer, usually the homeowner, uh, uh, somebody who's building a house or remodeling a house, they provide more information to them, i.e. you have to do more when you're working for a homeowner and therefore the rules are a lot more particular than if you're working on a commercial project and they expect the owner to lot, know a lot more and be more sophisticated. So the first, the most important question to start with is who are you in the construction project? A prime contractor is simply put someone who enters into a contract with the owner of the property to improve the land. So um, it was expanded about 14 years ago to include other classes of project or prime contractors such as project managers, construction managers, and other service providers who contract directly with the owner. There's no formal definition of subcontractor, but a subcontractor is essentially someone who is improving the property but doesn't have a direct contract with the owner. Same for a supplier, if you uh, are providing materials that benefit a project um, and you don't have a direct contract with the owner. And it's important to figure out where you fall because your notice requirements vary by claim type. Next question is, what did you do? This is where we look at the definition of an improvement. Um, this is a very broad definition of all sorts of ways that a contractor might improve a property. So I'll let you read that definition rather than reading it to you. But the important part is the statute mentions that this definition is an extension rather than a limitation, which basically means that it's to be read more broadly than less broadly. Usually the main controversy here is if you're coming in, improving a building and making it bigger and better, that's some improvement that's going to be covered. But what about the situation where you're just going to, you know, fix something that's broken? regular maintenance or the like. And that's where we oftentimes have the most controversy as to whether you're just showing up for, you know, to apply a little grease, fix a leak or the like. If you are a material supplier, it's also important to consider um, how the materials that you're delivering are used. 
Um, it's a very broad definition of what constitutes materials and includes equipment and tools and various other um, vehicles and um, associated components. But the key really is that your materials have to be delivered to an owner or a project and designated for use in that sole project. Delivering a whole bunch of materials not related to a specific project to a contractor's place of business is not sufficient to satisfy this requirement. Neither is delivery of regular inventory to a, uh, another contractor. In order to satisfy the def to be valid, a source supplier to have a lien rights against a project, their supplies have to be designated and used specifically on that project. And if you're supplying materials to somebody else just for them to keep in their stash or their stockpile, that doesn't satisfy that requirement. Services are covered too. Um, the definition was broadened um, several years ago and about 15 years ago to include those who are providing services. So designers and engineers are now also included in this. Um, we might have some HVAC designers on the line and it's important for you to recognize that your services will also fall uh, squarely within the lien statutes. Um, however, probably doesn't include a, an HVAC tune-up. Um, the question would come down to, are you actually improving the property or are you basically maintaining the property at, at status quo? And that's a question that we've we've had to go into detail with some customers in order to establish whether or not they have lien rights. And usually one of the first questions is, when does a project start? If we're talking about a ground up, the work starts usually with uh, a lot of the services that are done to get the real estate ready, including the, the excavator. And so that oftentimes is the start date uh, for not only the project as well as your date. And there are situations where your, um, your work may be later. It won't be the excavator, but will be later in the project but uh, your lien rights may actually retroactively go back to that first uh, date where the uh, property was worked on. So the importance of checking the timelines, um, this is extremely critical because all of the lien deadlines will run from these dates. Um, in order to file a lien, you'll need to know the start date of the entire work for the project, not just your work, um, but importantly, your start date, as well as the date that you last furnished labor services materials um, et cetera, on the project. This is a critical date because this is what starts the lean clock ticking. And a lot of people say, hey, uh, I'm not sure exactly when it was, or we talk to them and it appears that it's too late. Then they like to think, well, hey, can I just go back and tighten a bolt or do something to essentially extend that date? Um, and if it's a sham, it's gonna be exposed for that. It has to be a really part of the work as opposed to something that's contrived where you go back to try to do something to create a new last date. Timelines um, are different for large or commercial or large residential projects. A large residential project um, doesn't have anything to do with dollar amount necessarily. It's defined as being a project where there's more than four units. So uh, an apartment complex, um, you know, something larger than a duplex, maybe a condo with multiple units. Um, if you have a lar the larger your project is, then um, you sometimes don't have some of the other notice requirements, but you still have to satisfy the all important uh, providing note your prime contractor or subcontractor lien notice five months from the date of last work. Um, and your lien has to be filed no later than six months from the date of last work. We're gonna get into this a lot further. So rest assured that we're gonna be talking more about these deadlines further. This is really an overview. Um, it's important for the, to satisfy these deadlines to use the checklists and forms. Um, we have them um, that we can work with you to obtain, um, but there's also a lot that's, that's out there. But for the bigger the project, the more important it is to use those checklists and forms. Lastly, residential includes completely different requirements, um, including more notices. So that's the critical point here. So here's an example of a notice of intent form. This is the type of form that you need to fill out um, five, no later than five months from the date of last performance. So how are projects classified? So we have small residential projects, fewer than four family units. We have large residential, so that means more than four family living units, um, or non-residential, so more commonly referred to as commercial. So essentially the dividing line is between those that are small residential 
um, and uh, uh, non-residential or commercial, and the rules apply differently for those. And as I indicated, you have to provide more notice for those small residential, unsophisticated projects so those owners know what's coming as opposed to a regular developer or commercial project who's supposed to know that uh, there are notices and requirements. Right, and that's that's what we just put up here on the screen, that there's certain notice requirements that are eliminated for those larger projects. So what do you do if you are a prime contractor? So this means that you have a contract directly with the owner of the property. So for a private small residential project, the first deadline that you must comply with is to serve a 10 day notice within 10 days after first starting labor or furnishing materials. What we do for a lot of our clients, uh, if you're an HVAC contractor, you're putting in a new furnace on, on a home, that would clearly come under this. Um, and you can provide that 10 day notice either as a separate document and that's a form that uh, we can talk about or we can put that information actually in your contract and still be compliant. That way you don't have to remember because it's baked into your contract. And so if you're working on that new home or that small residential project for plumbing or mechanical or HVAC, typically baking it into your contract gets rid of the possibility that you'll forget to do it within that first 10 days. I come across a lot of contractors that don't even know about this requirement, and that's because we as their lawyers have helped them out and taken uh, the liberty of putting this notice in their contract so they don't even have to think about it. Uh, because importantly, if you don't give this notice, then you have to basically pay everyone up front in order to then be able to continue with the right to file a lien. The next step, if you are a prime contractor on a private small residential project, is when you are not paid, you have to serve a notice of intent to file claim for lien within 30 days before you file the lien claim. This is where the five months comes from. You have six months from last performance to file a claim for lien, but the notice of intent has to be filed or has to be served 30 days before. So it's important to, to not miss this critical deadline. And then lastly, you have to file that lien claim within six months from the date you last performed work or, for, or provided materials. So those are the specific rules for the uh, uh, small residential project. Right. And then we also have that you, once the lien is filed, you have 30 days to uh, serve a copy of it on the owner. And then your lien will only um, do what it's supposed to do if you file a summons and complaint to foreclose it within two years after the deadline for filing. And remember, if you don't file that lawsuit to uh, foreclose it, uh, it will evaporate uh, after two years, your legal rights. Right, so here's a notice of lien rights. This is what we commonly refer to as that 10-day notice. If you've never seen it before, it's probably because you have it in your contract. So for pri private large residential or non-residential projects, and again, that private large means more than four living units and non-residential means commercial, you are not required to serve a 10-day notice uh, for these projects. That being said, I would say 90% of you have it in your contract anyway, and that's a good, uh, good thing to do just so you don't have to think about it when you're going through whether this is a, a, a private large or a non-residential project versus a residential. The next formal step that you have to take to file a lien is that 30-day notice of intent from the um, five months from the date of last service of materials or labor. File the lien claim within six months. And so that means, you know, if you are sending your notice of intent on the last day of the fifth month and you only have 30 days to get that lien filed. You have to serve a copy of the lien claim on the owner within 30 days after filing it. And then you have to file, uh, if, if you're not paid in order to keep your lien um, of effect, you have to file a summons and complaint within two years. So essentially, Lauren, as I look at that list for the private large projects, uh, everything's the same except you don't have that 10 day notice. Right, that's really the fundamental difference. For prime contractors, I wanna note, um, that between the private large and non uh, residential and the residential projects. So most of most people are taking care of that 10 day notice in their contract anyway. So if you don't do any residential work, uh, you can essentially uh, follow the last four points of that, um, that presentation. So let's talk about the 30 day um, notice. So this is the notice of intent. Serve. Service is very particularly defined in the statutes 
Um, so when you serve a lien notice no later than five months from the date of last work, it must be done in one of these manners. Most people opt to do it by registered or certified mail, um, but I have had them and arranged for them to be personally delivered um, in certain instances. Uh, but for the most part, that's that's what you're going to do. That last point, by any other means in which the party receiving notice confirms delivery, I've had people ask me before whether that could be like FedEx with a, you know, a sign for delivery. Um, you know, it probably can, but I'm never going to take that risk because I want to go with what I know is going to be supported by the law, and that's either personal delivery or registered or certified mail. So as you can see, the, the key components are following the timelines and making sure that you have proof they've got your notice by one by service of one of these methods. So service must occur at least 30 days before the claim is filed. So that's why we say the five months after date of work last performed. I never advise clients to wait until the five month deadline. Um, you can serve a lien anytime after you're you're not paid. So if your terms are you know net 30 on day 31, you could serve a notice of intent. Um, but you have a lot of time to do it, and it's never it's never really necessary to wait until that absolute last minute. I know a lot of contractors uh, see what they call the notice of intent. The notice of intent is the same thing as what we're calling this 30 day notice. It's, it's 30 days. The notice of intent is served 30 days before you can file your claim uh, for lien. So uh, if you see those two uh, handles put on this document, the notice of intent is the 30 day notice before filing that lien claim. Right, and it's it's really the warning, and it must it's a prerequisite to the filing of a lien. So if someone sends you this, then uh, or you send it to a customer, it means pretty serious, and I'm going to file a lien. You should assume um, if you get one of these that your lien will will be filed if you don't make payment. Um, and then lastly, you should send a copy of that notice of intent, 30-day notice to the prime um, or the subcontractor that hired you, in addition to the owner, just as a good practice. So this is a copy of what the prime contractor notice of intent, the 30-day notice looks like. You can see right at the title, it, ca it calls it the notice of intent. And that's why a lot of people see that language. But remember, that's just telling you know the person upstream, hey, I haven't been paid and you need to know this is what I'm owed. And if you don't pay me within 30 days, I'm gonna file my claim for lien, which is obviously the uh, document which creates that encumbrance on the equity. Chris, if you don't mind chiming in, you know, how often do you, how long do you wait before serving a notice of intent on your, on your work? So, um, your, your last slide or maybe a couple of slides ago, you did make notice of this. So, um, I don't wait five months. Um, you know, I'm usually having dialogue and my guess is most contractors are having some sort of dialogue and, and leaving that five month window as a backstop, okay? Um, there could be a, a client that you're working with that right out of the gate, you just get this feeling like something's not right. So to your point, if your terms are net 30, on day 31, you might wanna send out that notice of intent, 30 day notice. Um, you know, sometimes it really is a gut check. Um, there might be somebody that's communicating well, and you say, okay, I'm not going to send that notice out just yet, but just so that they understand if it's not taken care of by X date. And I usually give myself 45 days at the latest. I don't use that. I don't push it right to five months. I say four and a half months. And that's my own internal kind of backstop. At the same time, Chris, I know sometimes your your field personnel can provide you intel as to you know how the product's going, what type of communication with the other trades, how the owner's reacting to uh, as well to give you that intel as to whether to send that shot over the bow with this notice of intent early, or can you wait because you feel comfortable? Okay, so completely so agreed. Um, yeah, I was just going to follow up and just say that say that oftentimes the field personnel are really your your best and first line of defense. They they really know hands on what's happening with that client. So I just wanted to echo that. Thanks, Chris. 
So still no payment, this is when you need to think about actually taking the step to file the lien. Um, you might be talking about a settlement arrangement with someone, but hey, your lien deadline is coming up within the next day. Uh, the court's not going to care if you had a settlement agreement that fell through and that's why you didn't file your lien. So there may be situations where you are making a very big decision as to whether to file a lien and potentially jeopardize the settlement or move forward. There's actually some upstream owners or generals who will play you, let you think you're going to get paid, knowing full well that you just allowed your uh, dates to slip by, and then suddenly they, they pull the rug from out from underneath you and find out that, oh, I'm not going to pay you now, forget that settlement discussion, and by the way, your lien rights are gone because you blew the deadline. Yep, it's a use, you, liens are use it or lose it, um, so at the point when you need to start preparing to file a lien, you need to start gathering those necessary documents uh, in order to do so. So the claim for lien, what does that involve? Uh, it has a whole list of things of name and address of the claimant, and you really should be looking for the, the address where you know that person receives mail to so make sure that you're um, complying. Sometimes when I'm doing these liens, I will duplicate notices and send them to multiple locations. So for instance, if the the property has one address, but the registered place of uh, principal place of business is different. I will sometimes send notices and claims for lien to both just to be safe. So you need to have the, the name, your name and address, the name and address of the owner, a legal description. In order to get a legal description, you will need to talk to a title company. You can't just go onto the county websites and pull that, you know, very abbreviated legal description. That is not the legal description. So do not rely on that information. You need to be contacting a title company in order to get a letter report of title to be certain that you've got the right legal description. The work description is a description of what you did. The first date of visible commencement on the work and both for you and the project and then your last labor date. Um, verification that you have sent out the notices that are required, the amount owed and also your signature. We oftentimes provide a lot of our clients what we call a master lien information sheet, which um, uh, allows them to have in their uh, project file um, all of this information so that when it comes time to actually file that claim, they're not scrambling because they've been populating this master information sheet uh, along the way and all they have to do is send it to us if they use us or a lien company to help file their lien. Right, and the signature um, has to be notarized. So be prepared for, you're gonna need a notary to file a lien. Um, and also you typically cannot get a letter report in one day. So again, yet another reason to not be doing this on, on the last day of your six months. Here's an example of what the prime contractor claim for a lien looks like. This is just the first page, but it there's fillable forms out there that you can use, but um, it's very important that these are filled out correctly to make sure you have the best chance of making your lien enforceable. So let's talk about subcontractors. How do they perfect their lien rights? Uh, private small residential project. This is where you have more requirements if you're a subcontractor. And this is typically where we see a lot of subcontractors screw up. Uh, serving, you have to serve what is called a 60 day notice or a subcontractor identification notice. That notice is typically not threatening. It's just saying, hey, I've been hired by the general. I want you to know that I'm here on the job and essentially I have lien rights, have a nice day. Uh, it's not a threatening document. It's sort of like the same uh, thing as the 10 day notice, but it's if you're a subcontractor, you just let the owner know that you're on the job for that small residential project. Yeah, it can. if the owner doesn't understand it, if they're not very sophisticated, um, they may ask you or, or if you're the, if you're the subcontractor or ask you if you're the prime contractor about it and you really just explain that this isn't this is the first step that's required is um, in order for somebody to perfect their lien rights and in no way does it mean that a lien will be filed on their job but if it's not done it will there there can't be a lien and so somebody's just protecting themselves so after that uh 60 day notice is sent let's say you're still not paid then you have to serve that 30 day notice of intent this is Apart from it being titled differently, this is basically the same form that you send when you're the prime contractor. So the, the key difference here for subcontractors is that they have that 60 day notice requirement where a prime contractor does not. You then have uh, six months 
after from the date of last performance to file your lien just like if you're a prime contractor you have to serve a copy of that lien on the owner within 30 days and again you have to execute on your lien within two years if you're not paid or it will go away so those same four bullet points are similar from what we see before exactly and so this is what the subcontractor identification notice or that 60-day notice looks like so you can see even though if you read it it just says i'm providing you know labor at the request of so and so on your project it can look a little bit intimidating so you may get questions again this has to be served so it needs to go by registered or certified mail or hand delivery so that that part can freak an owner out it's probably best if you have subcontractors to give the owner heads up that this might be coming um, within 60 days of first starting work so that they don't they don't see it and, and start to freak out it's not letting me move forward jonathan um, Jonathan. Still hung up. Still hung up. Yep. It says I have the controls, but it keeps going back and forth between you and me. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, I just took my camera off. Uh, I'm not touching anything. How about now? No. Uh, oh, oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so what did to do about the 60 day notice? Um, this is a preliminary notice um, and it is not required if you are working on a project that is more than four uh, living units or um, unres non-residential like commercial projects. So this is not something that you have to do if you're working on commercial projects or large residential projects. That 60 day notice the subcontractors don't have to do. It's just for small residential projects. So, and then we talked we talked about this before, but again, safe service requirement applies for subcontractors who are sending the 30-day notice of intent. Um, service has to be accomplished in one of these ways, no later than five months after the last work is performed. Uh, service must occur again at least 30 days before the lien filing. That's where we get the five months from. And then you should send a copy to the prime or a tier level up from you subcontractor who hired you if you're not paid time to file a lien claim again seldom does your settlement negotiation stop mean that you don't need to file a lien claim um, settlement arrangement goes today away the day after your lien deadline passes and you don't get to file a lien use it or lose it and this is where you need to gather your necessary documentation the requirements of the subcontractor claim for lien are the same um, so it's, again, this, the address is for everybody, legal descriptions, so you still need that letter report, um, work, amount owed, and then you got to sign it. So the, they're different forms, but the only key difference is whether or not you've satisfied that 60-day notice requirement for small residential projects, and then it will also ask who was the prime, prime contractor that hired you. Here's the, the, well, that looks like it's the prime contractor one, but it's substantially the same. Then you file a, the lien in the circuit court where the property is located. There's a filing fee. You should bring multiple copies so that you have uh, one gets kept by the court, one you have for service on the owner, and then it's always good to have a couple extras. Uh, then you need to serve a copy of that lien within 30 days on the owner. So post-filing, uh, you have to foreclose if you filed a lien Foreclose is, involves the filing of a summons and complaint within two years from the date you filed your lien. So it's important to calendar this deadline so you don't miss it. You are going to need an attorney to do this. Um, this part, you will have to have a lawyer for the foreclosure. So this goes back to what Roy started us out with. It may not be worth it to foreclose on a lien. Why is that, Roy? Well, I mean, uh, at one point, I think I was involved in the largest lien foreclosure, and there was a quarter million dollars worth of uh, bank loan, and there was $750,000 worth of equity, and there was about $2 million worth of claims. And so what you had to ferry out there is who's got you know, rights against that equity and the property and the priority and what people have done. So it's a fairly you know, sophisticated process 
um, uh, to have happen. And so it's a lawsuit and uh, you're trying to get paid from the equity, which means you got to pay off the bank. If the property sells for a million and the bank has a quarter million dollar debt, they get that first and whatever's left over can be uh, applied against the other lien claimants. If you haven't been paid and you're a subcontractor, there's likely other subcontractors who have been paid. So there's a pro rata analysis involved with that. But again, you're going after the equity and uh, in that property and you have to have a sheriff sale, the property gets sold, the money gets applied to the bank if there is one and then prorated and applied to those who have lien claims. Chris, have you gone through the process of foreclosing any of the liens that you filed? Uh, so fortunately, we have not had to go that far. I think once we've, um, we've only had a couple of situations where we've had to actually file a lien um, and shortly thereafter, uh, we've negotiated um, the payments, but haven't had to go as far as the foreclosure portion. Um, I guess the other thing that I would add in here is that um, sometimes going all the way back <clears throat> to the discussion of the 30-day notice, it's it's interesting, um, some dialogue that you might be having with a customer that they just, you know, don't have the money today, can, they, can we pay you in 45 days, et cetera. Interestingly enough, uh, I couldn't tell you how many times we've sent the 30-day notice and magically money appears, uh, you know, in a week. So um, sometimes just having them see the, um, you know, that one lever and you're willing to pull that one lever, uh, they will start to release cash. So no, we have not had to go as far as for foreclosure. Thank you. Yeah, one thing I think that's uh, that happens in that dynamic, uh, Chris, is you have to remember is that most people who are building take out loans, and when they find, sign a note in a mortgage, one of the promises they make to the bank is they won't allow liens to be filed. And so when they don't pay you, they're typically in default of their lender's uh, promises. And so that lender may put pressure on them as well. Uh, to get paid because they may be the, the bank may be the source of the money or the con or the owner is not uh, appropriately applying it. The bank will scold them and say, "Hey, get rid of that. We don't want that as part of our loan program." Okay, let's talk about some common mistakes. Failure to properly identify the owner and the property. Don't rely on what you've received with a you know a business name on it. You need to check this out yourself. Look at the recorded deed to find out who the owner of record is, but don't rely on their stationery or business cards to identify their correct name. And we know a lot of developers and have had uh, specific LLC, so we may have you know, Smith LLC, Smith 1 LLC, Smith 2 LLC, uh, looking at tax bills, online real estate, they can be informative, but they're not definitive. What is definitive, as Lauren has said, is, you know, getting an actual letter report from a title company usually costs $100, takes a few days to get the name and the legal description, which are critical, because we see that happen a lot. It's one of the things that when we're owners and our property owners, lawyers, when a property gets leaned, we'll look for that and see if you missed a comma, missed the correct name or the like, because that could prove to be fatally defective. Yeah, municipal records like tax assessors records um, and other sometimes municipal files, those are updated like only every 30 days. So if there's been a recent transfer of the title, you may not know that. And that's why it's really critical to talk to a title company because they have the most up-to-date information about ownership and legal description. So the next common mistake we see is failing to recognize that you're actually working for a tenant and not the owner of the property. Uh, the lien statutes require that if you are working for a tenant that you have basically the owner's permission to be performing improvements on that property. So it's, it's important that if you aren't working with the owner, um, and number one, it's important to find out, hey, are you a tenant in this property or do you actually own this? It's important to then also get something showing that the owner or the landlord consented to this work. Otherwise, um, even if you do everything right, you still may not have lien rights. Because the point being is the building owner is when he approves your work and the like, he's saying, yeah, um, I'll let you do this work and expose my equity in the business uh, for a tenant who may not pay you. So it's pretty uh, uh, rare that that landlord actually gives permission to uh, lien his equity. 
So again, failing to timely serve the, uh, serve the lien notices, failing to serve by proper service method, failing to f timely file your claim for liens, um, failing to include the required content, such as the correct legal description. Um, maybe you've signed some sort of partial lien waiver that wasn't really a partial lien waiver, um, and you've inadvertently given a full lien waiver before payment. That's it's really bad news, and we have to deliver that uh, to an owner. So it brings us to our next topic, careful use of lien waivers. The Wisconsin statutes say that any document that you sign purporting to be a waiver of lien rights is valid and binding as a waiver. So very critically, that means that if you sign a document that's a full waiver, even if you haven't been paid and you did not intend to fully waive your lien rights, you're gonna be out of luck on that. So um, I've heard Roy use the, the phrase CIF many a time. <laughs> yeah, cash and fish, you have to remember, if you get a check and uh, that you get the check on the last day of your lien rights and the check bounces, um, you have lost your lien rights, even though the check uh, you thought was good turned out. The best case you have then is a bad check case. And so the inverse of that is when you go to buy real estate, the bank requires certified funds, uh, cash, you know, that type of thing. When you give up lien rights, you're actually like a bank creditor who's handing over a deed uh, or a mortgage. You need to think about, you know, uh, what form of payment you're going to get. And if you literally don't get it in cash, I know it never happens. And this is think, it has people thinking that they're getting a regular check. If that regular check bounces uh, and the lien rights have expired, you're SOL. Or payment could be stopped. It's not hard for somebody to go stop a payment the day after they give you a check. Jonathan, did you take controls back? Seems it, hmm. Sorry, I, I keep trying to mute myself. Oh, you're working on control. I would, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so while you're working out the control piece, I, I just wanted to add one thing as it relates to cash and fist. Um, one extreme example that I've I've done on my own is I've actually engaged the services of a title company when I was getting close to leaning a property and we were getting very close to getting uh, funds. I still had something in my gut that told me that I was not real comfortable with this particular customer. I actually paid to have the title company uh, process all of the funding so that I knew that at least when, when the title company called me to, to deliver a waiver of lien, I knew that that check from the title company was was true. Oh, it looks like you muted yourself, Chris. <laughs> Lauren, have you been able to regain? Yep, I'm, I'm good. Control. Yeah, I can't. I can't regain while anyone else is talking, so I have to wait until nobody's talking, um, and then hopefully I can get it back. Nope, and I have not seen it pop up that says you have controls either. All right, let's see if I can re-give them to you. Now, it's because I have control, so let's see what happens if you take it back. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Jonathan, can you just advance it for us, please? There we go. Okay, partial lien waivers are sometimes appropriate, but it's important to clearly indicate uh, intent not to waive. There was actually a recent case that came down last month where somebody had intended to only give a partial waiver, but in order to do that, all they had done was crossed out full on the top of the lien waiver and wrote partial, but the language in the body of the lien waiver itself was unchanged. And so the court ruled that that was not sufficient to, um, not waive lien rights. So be very careful. Um, also important to review your contract to make sure you aren't uh, required to waive liens in advance and um, don't bow to the pressure to submit lien waivers before you are paid. I know sometimes you'll hear the whole, well, you're holding up the whole project. None of us can get paid until you provide this. Just be careful of that. So it's important to have careful use of forms. This is a sample of a, a waiver of construction lien that can be used as a partial or a final and um, it, you check the box accordingly um, as you, you want it to work. So recommendations, 
train key staff on lean procedures so that they know what the deadlines are, utilize um, you know, things like the lean book, at lean handbook and the forms that we have the larger your project the more hinky it seems the the more unusual facts you have and especially if you have a public or bonded project it's very important to consider calling an attorney to make sure you're properly perfecting your lien um, document payment problems thoroughly so that you're aware what which projects you are going to need to file liens against potentially and um, knowledge is power so additional leverage behind, besides lien law that you have, um, Wisconsin statutes provide some power to go after general contractors who don't pay, such as theft by contractor statute, which can create um, a personal liability and some potentially cannot be discharged in bankruptcy. There's also a civil theft statute that can give you some um, power here if, if for some reason you just find that yourself without liens. Um, this is kind of a sample of the master information list that Roy talked about earlier, what we use with our clients to make sure we get all the critical information as part of our lead in order to file a lien. We also have these flow charts to help our clients determine how they fall in the lien claimant categories and also classify the project. This is just to help them in that decision tree of what to do when and how to do it. So proposed changes to the lien, um, the lien procedures, you may have heard about this from you know, from this organization or other organization. Um, it's been skinny down quite a bit. I checked the last proposal that I saw as a member of the State Bar uh, Construction Law section was this change, which is basically um, an additional notice that an owner or a prime contractor can deliver to a lien claimant, basically demanding that they commence a lien foreclosure within 60 days, and if they don't, the lien is forfeited and then they can then ask the clerk to satisfy the lien upon request. This is being very heavily fought against by a lot of the contractor organizations. Personally, I don't think it's gonna get through, but we'll have to see. But um, obviously this this wouldn't be helpful to any of any of the contractors who really rely on liens as a means to enforce their payment. Um, the last portion we're gonna talk about is filing a bond claim. I don't want to go through each of the slides on this, but this information um, is, is available here. But it, this bond projects are very specific. They, you basically, if there's a bond on a project, then you don't have lien rights. So on a public project or a private project, if there's a lien, you will not have the power to file a lien in the conventional way that we just discussed. Basically, the payment bond is the form of your funding if you're not paid. So if in a lien situation, a real estate, your source of payment that is under the lien statutes is that equity. In a bonded project, the source of payment is the dollars that back the bond to protect you to make sure you get paid. Right. So there's a the, the really the summary I want to I'm going to go through these slides, but really the summary I want to make clear is you really need to contact a lawyer if you need to make a claim against a bond because the procedures are completely different. There's different notice requirements. Sometimes you don't have to file a notice. Sometimes you do. So the notice requirements are different because they depend, frankly, on what the bond says. So there's no statutory requirement that you have to notify a surety when you're not paid, but there may be that notice requirement in the bond itself. Therefore, it's really important that you have a copy of that bond so you can verify what the notice procedures are. Bonds are matters of contract, and so just like any other contract, it will dictate how it is to be enforced. So, so you have a contract that has a bond, ask for the bond, then read it because now those are your new rules. Mm -hmm. So a claim on a bond has to be brought within one year after the completion of the work. That's not just your completion of the work, that's completion of all of the work. Um, and often you may not know when that is. Um, so that's a hard deadline to make sure you're satisfying. Um, additionally, if the bond amount is insufficient to satisfy all bond claims and multiple parties are seeking payment from that bond, everybody gets paid proportionally. So like a lien where there's not enough equity, if there's not enough money in the bond, um, then you're not going to get full payment. So, but these are these are critical. There's additional liens that you can have on, on public projects um, against the money that due to the prime contractor. So you basically send written notice to that that um, organization or the municipality that basically um, says. Um, 
that I'm not paid and I want to want you to withhold funds um, on on this project before you pay out the, the prime contractor. Hey, Chris, do you have any experience with bond claims? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> you had mentioned um, getting a copy of the bond. If you know that you're on a bonded job, get that a, a copy of that bond early before you start your work, be certainly before you complete your work, you want to get a copy of the bond. It is not going to be a comfortable discussion. I think what's important is the more discussions that we all have with the prime contractor that holds that bond, we just need to make it a common discussion. But I'll tell you right now, it is not possible today. It'll be hard to get that copy. They'll fight you on giving you a copy of the bond, but ultimately I just badger them until I have my copy. I have had one situation on a bonded job that we were not successful in, in um, getting the money. It was a very complex, project it was a public project and ultimately uh this particular company uh filed for bankruptcy and the funds were completely exhausted by the time that filing occurred so um it people i think have this um belief that working on a project to get paid you're guaranteed to get paid i can attest to the fact that that is not indeed the case so uh having a copy of that bond early is is so important and so powerful All right. Thanks, Chris. So um, key, key note, you know, if you are going to make a claim against the, the proceeds due to the prime contractor, you have to serve that notice on the prime contractor in addition to the owner. Um, again, within a certain time period, that's why these are so critical and hard to follow. If it's timely submitted, then the owner has a duty as well as the lender to make that sufficient funds are withheld from the prime contractor in order to pay you. So if they violate that duty, they can be liable to you for damages. So this is when a bond exists on a public project. This is just another way in addition to the, the bond to um, ensure that you get paid. The problem with this is you often have no idea whether there's funds left to be paid to the prime contractor. And for, you know, contractors like yourself, which are going to come, you know, kind of near the end of the project in, in a lot of cases, um, you know there may not be as enough left to satisfy you so that's why it's really important on public projects to be uh, super attentive to when you're when you're not getting paid so you don't lose these remedies so if um you do serve that notice of withholding um on the the owner the prime contractor can then dispute it and then basically nothing happens if they dispute it you have to file a claim a lawsuit um or you're not gonna get any of those withheld funds. So basically it puts the owner in the position of, well, we're not gonna pay anybody because you're saying you're unpaid and they're disputing it. So they're gonna wait for a court to tell them what to do. Okay, so if they don't dispute it, then the owner has to pay. Um, and again, proportional payment if there's not enough money left withheld by the owner in order to pay everybody. This is basically what I was saying there. So that's the payment of the proceeds that are held. All right, we have about five minutes to spare. I apologize for rushing through that last section, but my overall point is, is if you find yourself needing to make a claim on a public project or on a private bonded project, you really need to be seeking legal counsel. I think we find that generally most of our contractor clients will um, you know, try to internally handle their lean processes. Um, we can, we have provided for them lean handbooks, which allow them to uh, take this process to a certain point, but there are certain situations where most of our contractor clients get out of their comfort zone uh, in terms of the amount, the risk, uh, tenant claims, bond claims, and they feel they need to get help. Certainly the resources for you as contractors are internally handling it, outsourcing it, to a lean payment or a lean filing um, company. We've seen a lot of those. Um, they can be helpful and cost effective, but they can't file a lawsuit for you. Uh, but we have seen in their um, documentation where it's not exactly right. Um, and so you need to obviously be conscious of that. Um, I just saw a question pop up and that's a very good question um, from Tara. 
When establishing the date of last work, does warranty work count towards the project? No, it doesn't. This is really the date that you last performed your basic contract services, not warranty callbacks. So if you're relying on a date, you went back six months later to fix a warranty issue, you have missed your lien deadline. So warranty work absolutely does not count towards the date of last work. Um, just for a little context for the group, the reason why the association thought it was appropriate to bring this subject to you is, and I know it's reflective of the folks on the call, these issues hit contractors big or small, right? And some of the larger firms who have more experience or more bandwidth or more resource have people in the company who can keep their eye on these timelines. Chris, you had mentioned to Lauren and I on our call about how your firm does this because although not a one person shop as an owner operator, you know, you have a different set of resources um, in, in how you backstop each other with timelines. Do you wanna just touch base really quickly and give that little tip that you gave us on how you're tracking the, the, the ticking clock on your projects? Yeah, so essentially what we've done is we've created um, a, a very simple three ring binder um, that just shows, you know, the, the different scenarios, much like the flow chart that you just saw in today's presentation. So first of all, are we the prime or are we a sub? And, and just follow the, the pathway from there. And then, in, in, uh, have you done the 10 day notice? Um, have you, what was your last date of labor, et cetera? So we created a chart that actually just timelines it out and we have various parts of that highlighted. And we actually share that information with project managers. We share that information with um, our controller, obviously takes care of all that information. But then we'll also share that information with our foreman so that they understand why it is so important that they report their final date of labor. And, and the warranty question and answer was, was, was perfect because till this day, even though we have this binder in place, people still ask that question. Well, what if we go back for warranty? doesn't count. So I'm really glad that question came up and that question was answered. So that's kind of how we've done it. Hey, Chris, I have to commend you because many uh, contractors sort of leave it to their billing and accounting uh, to take care of it. And of course, they can't fill in the blanks about those initial work dates. Um, and so having that full team approach and appreciation of all of those deadlines uh, is critical because obviously billing and the accounting department is looking for the money to come in but may not be cognizant of those initial dates or the finishing dates to understand the importance of those lien rights. So when we do our seminars to our in-house counsel or in-house contractors, we try to emphasize exactly what you did is making sure all the stakeholders, particularly if there's somebody who's going to make, you know, who sold the job, maybe he's the project manager, the like, and he stands to make an extra buck, you know, because he sold this job, you want to make sure he carries the ball to the goal line and gets everything paid. And, and that person will be invested if they understand that their compensation is somehow connected with, with collecting that money, i.e. making sure the lien rights are complied with. So one of the other motivations behind doing this was to, again, highlight for everyone, this is not easy uh, material to handle. And having partners like Michael Best, um, as Roy said, who are associate members of the of the alliance, which is great. Having legal partners that watch this and help you is tremendously valuable. Um, Lauren and Roy, can you just say uh, just a quick commercial for how someone would engage with you if they're looking to have more feedback or consultation on a specific issue? Yeah, we try to make sure for our, our clients, there's uh, very few impediments to, to reaching out. I'd rather have a call that was unnecessary than when then it was too late. So we try to do what I call a risk-free experience on the front end. I'd rather have somebody call me, tell me what's going on. If I tell them, no, you don't need me, they're not going to get a bill. Uh, but it's the, the guy who calls me a day late, a month late, or the like, or I should say the, the contractor, uh, which is the hardest. So we try to uh, remove those barriers about, you know, oh, I don't want to spend, you know, 100 bucks or 500 bucks to pay a lawyer. I can handle this myself. And so uh, our goal is to try to talk to people early, remove the uh, obstacles and limitations on whether they do. And we just don't want any reluctance to uh, uh, making that call. And obviously, lean is so deadline driven you know, a day late is, you know, a big problem. Uh, and then understanding those concepts on the front end, that's why we do a lot of in-house training for 
um, our contractors to make sure they understand it. And we want them to do as much as they can so they don't end up calling a lawyer, you know, every time they, you know, inhale. And so we try to educate them so they can do what they can and then understand where they, when they need help. It's just like anything else. That's great. I think in the era that we're in now of increased material costs, um, tighter margins and all that's involved with shrinking that profit for contractors, having uh, resources like Michael Best uh, in their corner is really helpful. So thank you for that. You know, the last thing I wanted to comment on, Lauren, you brought it up yesterday. Um, the theme of this uh, presentation and the, and the theme of liens, as it were, is although they can carry a connotation with them of being a quasi-aggressive attempt to collect, they should be a necessary part of your day-to-day -day business. You know, filing those notices should not be something contractors are scared of. It should not be something that should be interpreted as an attack on um, the payor. So, you know, if you just wanted to comment on that really quickly, I thought it was effective yesterday when you talked about the necessity of being um, proactive in this process. Right. I think I, I use the like the phrase normalized, you know, lean notices um, because it has such a connotation of being um, aggressive when really it really it should be um, basically nothing more than a, an account statement. Um, you are late on your payment. I'm reminding you of that and I'm taking the necessary steps to, to perfect my um, ability to file a lien. Um, and so a lot of owners will who own lots of properties will think of it in that perspective, but the, the smaller owners get it and freak out. And so I think opening the conversation early um, and letting people know that that's, that's what you're going to do, I think is very important um, to removing this kind of aggressive um, adversarial feeling surrounding uh, lien notices and when they're sent out. Um, and, you know, lenders really freak out about them, even though they shouldn't. But I will tell you, working with lenders, that lenders will freak out if a lien notice gets sent to them. Um, and really, the lenders are the most protective people in the entire chain. Um, I think the second message that, that, that is associated with that, with what the Lauren's saying, is a lot of people say when you file liens, hey, aren't you a partner here? Aren't you, why are you working with us? Why are you trying to, you know, upset the apple cart? But remember, you're the, you're the steward of your own money. And if you don't act like it's important, it's not going to be considered important. And uh, secondly, if you want to act like an adult business, you know, uh, protect your rights. And so when somebody says, hey, why are you doing that? I said, well, I just need to get paid. And I want to make sure, because if I let my lien rights go, they're gone forever. I won't ever have, have, have a chance to, you know, uh, uh, get them back. So letting people know that you're just acting like an adult business. And sometimes it sends a message that you're sophisticated. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, the unsophisticated contractors will take a handshake, take a check that bounces of the like. Um, and remember, it may not, um, it, it will send a message for your future jobs and the people that you work with. So you get a reputational uh, upside if you, you know, following your lien rights, but you're doing it politely. Don't be a jerk about it or the like. Uh, um, it just lets them know that you care about your money getting paid. And that's the name of the game, right? Getting paid. <laughs> we do we do great work. We might as well get paid for it. Uh, Chris Martinez, anything to add here before we break? Uh, no, I just want to send out a, a thank you to Roy and Lauren and, and certainly yourself. Um, I think that this is such important information and, and, and great to have open dialogue about this and, and normalize it. I love that, Lauren. I, I think that normalizing these types of uh, activities is important in our industry. So uh, thank you to everybody for attending today, too. Thank yes, you, thank Chris. You for us to be a part of this. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So I want to thank Lauren and Roy and Chris. I have their contact information up on the screen for Lauren and Roy. As mentioned at the outset, I will share this presentation with all who attended. Um, if you have follow-up for any of our participants uh, or presenters, I'm sorry, please contact them directly or come through the association. Um, with that, we're a wrap. We're a little over time, but I think it was worth it because the the concept and the context of this conversation is pretty involved. Uh, kudos to, to Lauren and Roy for getting through it in just uh, just over an hour, but we welcome any further follow-up. We hope that you continue to derive value from these presentations that the association is able to put on. We thank Michael Rest and Friedrich for their partnership as associate members, and of course, Dairyland Solutions and Chris Martinez as contractor members. So, 
look for this coming through on email, um, on YouTube, and if you have questions, follow up. Otherwise, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Uh, stay healthy, stay busy, and stay safe. Thank you all. Have a good day.